Wotan, written in 1936 by Carl Jung. When we look back to the time before 1914, we find ourselves living in a world of events which would have been inconceivable before the war. We were even beginning to regard war between civilized nations as a fable, thinking that such an absurdity would become less and less possible in our rational, internationally organized world. And what came after the war was a veritable witch's Sabbath everywhere, fantastic revolutions, violent alterations of the map, reversions in politics to medieval or even antique prototypes, totalitarian states that engulf their neighbors and outdo all previous theocracies in their absolutist claims, persecutions of Christians and Jews, wholesale political murder, and finally we have witnessed a light-hearted piratical raid on a peaceful, half-civilized people. That's Abyssinia. With such goings-on in the wide world, it is not in the least surprising that there should be equally curious manifestations on a smaller scale in other spheres. In the realm of philosophy, we shall have to wait some time before anyone is able to assess the kind of age we are living in. But in the sphere of religion, we can see at once that some very significant things have been happening. We need feel no surprise that in Russia, the colorful splendors of the Eastern Orthodox Church have been superseded by the movement of the godless. Indeed, one breathed aside superfluity of sacred paraphernalia. Tasteless and pitiably unintelligent as it is, and however deplorable the low spiritual level of the scientific reaction, it was inevitable that 19th century scientific enlightenment should one day dawn in Russia. But what is more than curious, indeed piquant to a degree, is that an ancient god of storm and frenzy, the long quiescent Wotan, should awake like an extinct volcano to new activity in a civilized country that had long been supposed to have outgrown the Middle Ages. We have seen him come to life in the German youth movement, and right at the beginning, the blood of several sheep was shed in honor of his resurrection. Armed with rucksack and loop, the blonde youths and sometimes girls as well were seen to be seen as restless wanderers on every road from the North Cape to Sicily, faithful votaries of the roving God. Later, towards the end of the Weimar Republic, the wandering role was taken over by the tens of the thousands of unemployed who were to be met with everywhere on their aimless journeys. By 1933, they wandered no longer, but marched in their hundreds of thousands. The Hitler movement literally brought the whole of Germany to its feet, from five-year-olds to veterans, and produced the spectacle of a nation migrating from one place to another. Wotan, the wanderer, was on the move. He could be seen looking rather shamefaced in the meeting house of a sect of simple folk in North Germany disguised as Christ sitting on a white horse. I do not know if these people were aware of Wotan's ancient connection with the figures of Christ and Dionysus, but it is not very probable. Wotan is a restless wanderer who creates unrest and slips and stirs up strife, now here, now there, and works magic. He was soon changed by Christianity into the devil and only lived on in fading local traditions as a ghostly hunter who was seen with his retinue flickering like a will-o'-the-wisp through the stormy night. In the Middle Ages, the role of the restless wanderer was taken over by Ahasuerus, the wandering Jew, which is not a Christian, but a, or not a Jewish, but a Christian legend. The motif of the wanderer who has not accepted Christ was projected on the Jews in the same way as we always discover our unconscious psychic contents in other people. At any rate, the coincidence of anti-Semitism with the reawakening of Wotan is a psychological subtlety that may perhaps be worth mentioning. The German youths who celebrated the solstice with sheep sacrifices were not the first to hear a rustling in the primeval forest of the unconscious. They were anticipated by Nietzsche, Schuller, Stefan George, and Ludwig Klages. The literary tradition of the Rhineland and the country south of the Maine 
has a classical stamp that cannot easily be gotten rid of. Every interpretation of intoxication and exuberance is apt to be taken back to classical models, to Dionysus, to the pure Eternus, and the cosmogonic, cosmogonic Eros. No doubt it sounds better to academic ears to interpret these things as Dionysus, but Wotan might be a more correct interpretation. He's the god of storm and frenzy, the unleasher of passions and the lust of battle. Moreover, he is a superlative magician and artist in illusion who is versed in all secrets of an occult nature. Nietzsche's case is certainly a peculiar one. He had no knowledge of Germanic literature. He discovered the cultural Philistine and the announcement that God is dead led to Zarathustra's meeting with an unknown God in unexpected form who approached him sometimes as an enemy and sometimes disguised as Zarathustra himself. Zarathustra too was a soothsayer, a magician, and the storm wind, quote, and like a wind shall I come to blow among them, and with my spirit shall take away the breath of their spirit. Thus my future wills it. Truly a strong wind is Zarathustra to all that are low, and this counsel gives heed to his enemies and to all that spit and spew. Beware of spitting against the wind. And when Zarathustra dreamed that he was guardian of the graves in the lone mountain fortress of death and was making a mighty effort to open the gates suddenly, a roaring wind tore the gates asunder, whistling, shrieking, and keening. It cast a black coffin before me, and amid the roaring and whistling and shrieking, the coffin burst open and spouted a thousand peals of laughter. The disciple who interpreted the dream said to Zarathustra, Are you not yourself the wind with shrill whistling, which bursts open the gates of the fortress of death? Are you not yourself the coffin filled with life's gray malice and angel grimaces? In 1863 or 1864, in his poem, To the Unknown God, Nietzsche had written, I shall and will know thee, unknown one, who searches out the depths of my soul and bloweth through my life like a storm, ungraspable and yet my kinsman. I shall and will know thee and serve thee. Twenty years later, in his Mistral song, he wrote, Mistral wind, chaser of clouds, killer of gloom, sweeper of the skies, raging storm wind, how I love thee. Are we not both the first fruits of the same womb, forever predestined to the same fate? In the Dithyram known as Ariadne's Lament, Nietzsche is completely the victim of the hunter god. Quote, stretched out, shuddering, like a half-dead thing whose feet are warmed, shaken by unknown fevers, shivering with piercing icy frost arrows, hunted by thee, O thought, unutterable, veiled, horrible one, thou huntsman behind the clouds, struck down by thy lightning bolt, thou mocking eye that stares at me from the dark. Thus I lie, writhing, twisting, tormented, with all eternal tortures smitten by thee. Cruel huntsman, thou unknown god. This remarkable image of the hunter god is not a mere dithyrambic figure of speech, but is based on an experience which Nietzsche had when he was 15 years old at Forta. It was described in a book by Nietzsche's sister, Elizabeth Furster Nietzsche. As he was wandering about in a gloomy wood at night, he was terrified by a blood-curdling shriek from a neighboring lunatic asylum, and soon afterwards he came face to face with a huntsman whose features were wild and uncanny. Setting his whistle to his lips in a valley surrounded by wild scrub, the huntsman blew up a shrill blast, such a shrill blast that Nietzsche lost consciousness, but woke up again in Forta. It was a nightmare. It is significant that in his dream, Nietzsche, who in reality intended to go to Eiselben, Luther's town, discussed with the huntsman the question of going instead to Tuchenthal, the Valley of the Germans. No one with ears to hear can misunderstand the shrill whistling of the storm god in the nocturnal wood. Was it really the only classical philologist in Nietzsche only the classical philolo philologist in Nietzsche that led to the god being called Dionysus instead of Wotan? Or was it perhaps due to his fateful meeting with Wagner? In his Reich on Rome, 
which was first published in 1919, Bruno Goetz was the first, was the, saw the secret of coming events in Germany in the form of a very strange vision. I have never forgotten this little book, for it struck me at the time as a forecast of the German weather. It anticipates the conflict between the realm of ideas and life, between Wotan's dual nature as a god of storm and a god of secret musings. Wotan disappeared when his oaks fell and disappeared again, or appeared again when the Christian god proved too weak to save Christendom from fratricidal slaughter. When the Holy Father at Rome could only impotently lament before God the fate of the Grex Segregatus, the old one-eyed hunter, on the edge of the German forest, laughed and saddled Schleipner. We are always convinced that the modern world is a reasonable world, basing our opinions on economic, political, and psychological factors. But if we may forget for a moment that we are living in the year of our Lord, 1936, and laying aside our well-meaning, all-too-human reasonableness, may burden God or the gods with a responsibility for contemporary events instead of man, we would find Wotan quite suitable as a causal hypothesis. In fact, I venture the heretical suggestion that the unfathomable depths of Wotan's character explain more of national socialism than all three reasonable factors put together. There is no doubt that each of these factors explains an important aspect of what is going on in Germany, but Wotan explains yet more. He is particularly enlightening in regard to the general phenomenon which is so strange to anybody not a German that it remains incomprehensible even after the deepest reflection. Perhaps we may sum up this general phenomenon as Ergriffenheit, a state of being seized or possessed. The term postulates not only an Ergriffener, one who is seized, but also an Ergriffer, one who seizes. Wotan is an Ergriffer of men, and unless one wishes to deify Hitler, which has indeed actually happened, he is really the only explanation. It is true that Wotan shares this quality with his cousin Dionysus, but Dionysus seems to have exercised in his influence mainly on women. The Menids were a species of female stormtroopers, and according to mythical reports, were dangerous enough. Wotan confined himself to berserkers who found their vocation as the black shirts of mythical kings. A mind that is still childish thinks of the gods as metaphysical entities existing in their own right or else regards them as playful or superstitious inventions. From either point of view, the parallel between Wotan, Redivivus, and the social, political, and psychic storm that is shaking Germany might have at least the value of a parable. But since the gods are without doubt personifications of psychic forces, to assert their metaphysical existence is as much of an intellectual presumption as the opinion that they could never be invented. Not that psychic forces have anything to do with the conscious mind, fond as we are of playing with the idea that consciousness and psyche are identical. This is only another piece of intellectual presumption. Psychic forces have far more to do with the realm of the unconscious. Our mania for rational explanations obviously has its roots in our fear of metaphysics, for the two are always hostile brothers. Hence, anything unexpected that approaches us from that dark realm is regarded either as coming from outside and therefore as real, or else as a hallucination and therefore not true. The idea that anything could be real or true which does not come from the outside has hardly begun to dawn on contemporary man. For the sake of better understanding and to avoid prejudice, we could, of course, dispense with the name Wotan and speak instead of the Führer Teutonicus. But we should only be saying the same thing and not as well, for the Führer, in this case, is a mere psychologizing of Wotan and tells us no more than that the Germans are in a state of fury. We thus lose sight of the most, most peculiar feature of this whole phenomenon, namely the dramatic aspect of the Engriffer and the Ergriffener. The impressive thing about the German, German phenomenon is that one man, who is obviously possessed, has infected a whole nation to such an extent that everything is, is set in motion and has started rolling on its course towards perdition. 
It seems to me that Wotan hits the mark as a hypothesis. Apparently, he really was only asleep in Kaifasar Mountain until the ravens called him and announced the break of day. He is a fundamental attribute of the German psyche, an irrational psychic force which acts on the high pressure of civilization like a cyclone and blows it away. Despite their crankiness, the Wotan worshippers seem to have judged things more correctly than the worshippers of reason. Apparently, everyone had forgotten that Wotan is a Germanic datum of the first importance, the true expression and unsurpassed personification of a fundamental quality that is particularly characteristic of the Germans. Houston Stuart Chamberlain is a symptom which arouses suspicion that other veiled gods may be sleeping elsewhere. The emphasis on the Germanic race, vulgarly called Aryan, the Germanic heritage, blood and soil, the Vagawila songs, the ride of the Valkyries, Jesus as a blonde blue-eyed hero, the Greek mother of St. Paul, the devil as an international Alberic in Jewish or Masonic disguise, the Nordic bo aurora borealis as the light of civilization, the inferior Mediterranean races, all this is the indispensable scenery for the drama that is taking place and at bottom, they all mean the same thing. A god has taken possession of the Germans, and their house is filled with a mighty rushing wind. It was soon after Hitler seized power, if I'm not mistaken, that a cartoon appeared in Punch of a raving berserker tearing himself free from his bonds. A hurricane has broken loose in Germany, while we still believe it is fine weather. Things are comparatively quiet in Switzerland, though occasionally there is a puff of wind from the north or south. Sometimes it has a slightly ominous sound. Sometimes it whispers so harmlessly or even idealistically that no one is alarmed. Let sleeping dogs lie. We manage to get along pretty well in this proverbial wisdom. It is sometimes said that the Swiss are singularly averse to making a problem of themselves. I must rebut this accusation. The Swiss do have their problems, but they would not admit it for anything in the world, even though they see which way the wind is blowing. We thus pay our tribute to the time of storm and stress in Germany, but we never mention it, and this enables us to feel vastly superior. It is above all the Germans who have an opportunity, perhaps unique in history, to look upon look into their own hearts, and to learn what those perils of the soul were from which Christianity tried to rescue mankind. Germany is a land of spiritual catastrophes, where nature never makes more than a pretense of peace with ruling world-ruling wisdom. The disturber of the peace is a wind that blows into Europe from Asia's vastness, sweeping in on a wide front from Thrace to the Baltic, scattering the nations before it like dry leaves or inspiring thoughts that shake the world to its foundations. It is an elemental Dionysus breaking into the Apollonian order. The rouser of this tempest is named Wotan, and we can learn a good deal about him from the political confusion and spiritual upheaval he has caused throughout history. For a more exact investigation of his character, however, we must go back to the age of myths, which did not explain everything in terms of man and his limited capacities, but sought the deeper cause in the psyche and its aut autonomous powers. Man's earliest intuitions personified these powers as gods and described them in the myths with great care and circumstantiality according to their various characters. This could be done the more readily on account of the firmly established primordial types or images which are innate in the unconscious of many races and exercise a direct influence upon them. Because the behavior of a race takes on its specific character from its underlying images, we can speak of an archetype, Wotan. As an autonomous psychic factor, Wotan produces effects in the collective life of a people and thereby reveals his own nature. For Wotan has a peculiar biology of his own, quite apart from the nature of man. It is only from time to time that individuals fall under the irresistible influence of this unconscious factor. 
When it is quiescent, no one is more aware of the archetype, Votan, than of a latent epilepsy. Could the Germans who were adults in 1914 have foreseen what they would be today? Such amazing transformations are the effect of the god of wind that bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. It seizes everything in its path and overthrows everything that is not firmly rooted. When the wind blows, it shakes everything that is insecure, whether without or within. Martin Nink has recently published a monograph, which is a most welcome addition to our knowledge of Wotan's nature. The reader need not fear that this book is nothing but a scientific study written from an academic aloofness from the subject. Certainly the right to scientific objectivity is fully preserved, and the material has been collected with extraordinary thoroughness and presented in unusually clear form, but over and above all this, one feels that the author is vitally interested in it, that the chord of Votan is vibrating in him too. This is no criticism. On the contrary, it is one of the chief merits of the book, which without this enthusiasm might easily have degenerated into a tedious catalog. Nink stretches a really magnificent portrait of the German archetype Wotan. He describes him in 10 chapters using all the available sources as the berserker, the god of storm, the wanderer, the warrior, the Wunsch, the Min god, the lord of the dead and of the Eicherier, the master of secret knowledge, the magician, and the god of the poets. Neither the Valkyries nor the Filja are forgotten for they form part of the mythological background and fateful significance of Wotan. Ninsk inquiry into the name and its origin is particularly instructive. He shows that Wotan is not only a god of rage and frenzy who embodies the instinctual and emotional aspect of the unconscious. Its intuitive and inspiring side also manifests itself in him, for he understands the runes and can interpret fate. The Romans identified Wotan with Mercury, but his character does not really correspond to any Roman or Greek god, although there are certain resemblances. He is a wanderer like Mercury, for instance, rules over the dead like Pluto and Kronos, and is connected with Dionysus by his emotional frenzy, particularly in its mantic aspect. It is surprising that Nink does not mention Hermes, the god of Revelation, who has Numa and Nous is associated with the wind. He would be the connecting link between with the Christian Numa and the miracle of the Pentecost. As Poimandres, the shepherd of men Hermes, is an Ergrefer like Wotan. Nink rightly points out that Dionysus and the other Greek gods always retained, uh, remained under the supreme authority of Zeus, which indicates a fundamental difference between the Greek and the Germanic temperament. Nink assumes an inner affinity between Wotan and Kronos, and the latter's defeat may perhaps be a sign that the Wotan archetype was once overcome and split up in prehistoric times. At all levels, the Germanic god represents a totality on a very primitive level, a psychological condition in which man's will was almost identical with the gods and entirely at his mercy. But the Greeks had gods who helped man against the other gods. Indeed, all Father Zeus himself is not far from the ideal of a benevolent, enlightened despot. It was not in Wotan's nature to linger long on and show signs of old age. He simply disappeared when the times turned against him and remained invisible for more than a thousand years, working anonymously and indirectly. Archetypes are like riverbeds, which dry up when the water deserts them, but which it can find again at any time. An archetype is like an old water course along which the water of life has flowed for centuries, digging a deep channel for itself. The longer it has flowed in this channel, the more likely it is that sooner or later the water will return to its old bed. The life of the individual as a member of society, and particularly as a part of the state, may be regulated like a canal, but the life of nations is a great rushing river which is utterly beyond human control in the hands of one who has always been stronger than men. The League of Nations, 
which was supposed to possess supranational authority, is regarded by some as a child in need of care and protection, by others as an abortion. Thus, the life of nations rolls on unchecked, without guidance, unconscious of where it is going, like a rock crashing down the side of a hill until it is stopped by an obstacle stronger than itself. Political events move from one impasse to the next, like a torrent caught in gullies, creeks, and marshes. All human control comes to an end when the individual is caught in a mass movement. When the archetypes begin to function, as happens also in the lives of individuals when they are confronted with situations that cannot be dealt with in any, any of the familiar ways, but what a so-called Fuhrer does with a mass movement can plainly be seen if we turn our eyes to the north or south of our country. The ruling archetype does not remain the same forever, as is evident from the temporal limitations that have been set to the hoped-for reign of peace, the Thousand-Year Reich. The Mediterranean father archetype of the just, order-loving, benevolent ruler has been shattered over the whole of Northern Europe, as the present fate of the Christian churches bear witness. Fascism in Italy and the Civil War in Spain show that in the South, as well as the Cataclysm, has been far greater than the one expected. Even the Catholic Church can no longer afford trials of strength. The nationalist God has attacked Christianity on a broad front. In Russia, he is called technology and science. In Italy, Duce. In Germany, German faith, German Christianity, or the state. The German Christians are contradiction in terms and would do better to join Hauer's German faith movement. These are decent and well-meaning people who honestly admit their Egriffenheit and try to come to terms with this new and undeniable fact. They go to an enormous amount of trouble to make it look less alarming by dressing it up in conciliatory historical garb and giving us consoling glimpses of great figures such as Meister Eckert, who was also a German and also Egriffen. In this way, the awkward question of who the Ergrefer is, is circumvented. He was always God. But the more Howard restricts the worldwide sphere of Indo-European culture to the Nordic in general, and to the Edda in particular, and the more German his faith becomes as a manifestation of Ergrefenheit, the more painfully evident it is that the German God is the God of the Germans. One cannot read Howard's book without emotion. If one regards it as the tragic and really heroic effort of a conscientious scholar who, without knowing how it happened to him, was violently summoned by the inaudible voice of the ergrifer and is now trying with all his might and with all his knowledge and ability to build a bridge between the dark forces of life and the shining world of historical ideas. But what do all the beauties of the past from totally different levels of culture mean to the man of today when confronted with a living and unfathomable tribal god such as he has never experienced before? They are sucked like dry leaves into the roaring whirlwind, and the rhythmic alliterations of the Edda become inextricably mixed up with the Christian mystical texts, German poetry, and the wisdom of the Upanishads. Hauer himself is a griffin, by the depths of meaning in the primal words laying at the root of the Germanic languages, to an extent that he certainly never knew before. Howard the Indologist is not to blame for this, nor yet the Edda. It is rather the fault of Kairos, the present moment in time, whose name on a closer investigation turns out to be Wotan. I would therefore advise the German faith movement to throw aside their scruples, Intelligent people will not confuse them with the crude Wotan worshippers whose faith is a mere pretense. There are people in the German faith movement who are intelligent enough not only to believe but to know that the God of the Germans is Wotan and not the Christian God. This is a tragic experience and no disgrace. It has always been terrible to fall into the hands of a living God. Yahweh was no exception to this rule and the Philistines, Edomites, Amorites, and the rest who were outside the Yahweh experience 
must certainly have followed, found it exceedingly disagreeable. The Semitic experience of Allah was for a long time an extremely painful affair for whole of, the whole of Christendom. We who stand outside judge the Germans far too much as if they were responsible agents, but perhaps it would be nearer the truth to regard them also as victims. If we apply our admittedly peculiar point of view consistently, we are driven to conclude that Wotan must, in time, reveal not only the restless, violent, stormy side of his character, but also his ecstatic and mantic qualities, a very different aspect of his nature. If this conclusion is correct, National Socialism would not be the last word. Things must be concealed in the background, which we cannot imagine at present but we may expect them to appear in the course of the next few years or decades. Wotan's reawakening is a stepping back into the past. The stream was dammed up and has broken into its old channel. But the obstruction will not last forever. It is rather a regular, oh, a regular pour mieux sortir, and the water will overleap the obstacle. Then at last, we shall know what Wotan is saying when he murmurs with the memer's head. Fast move the suns is heard in the note, wait, now oh, this is a poem. Fast move the sons of men and fate is heard in the note of Gyalja horn. Loud blows Heimdall, the horn is aloft. In fear quake all who on hell roads are. Yggdrasil shakes and shivers on high, the ancient limbs and the giant is loose. Wotan murmurs on, with Mimir's head, but the kinsmen of Surt shall slay him soon. How fare the gods, how fare the elves? All Jotunheim groans, the gods are at council. Loud roar the dwarves by the doors of stone, the master of rocks, would you know yet more? Now Garm howls loud before Gnipilur. The fetters will burst and the wolf run free. Much do I know and more can see of the fate of gods, the mighty in fight. From the east comes Hrym with shield held high. In giant wrath doth the serpent writhe. O'er the waves he twists and the tawny eagle gnaws corpses screaming. Now the far is loose. O'er the seas from the north, there sails a ship. With the people of hell, at the helm stands Loki. After the wolf do wild men follow, and with them the brother of Bylist goes.